That is the question all of us must answer, and I, I hope that most of you have made that choice already. And hopefully it was a good choice, um, but we are, we're going down this, uh, down this road together. We're on this journey to find out who Jesus really is so we can make that, that quality choice. That's the most important decision you will ever make. And uh, like we frequently say here, it doesn't matter what you're going to do for dinner afterwards. It doesn't matter what you did today. It doesn't matter what you're going to do tomorrow. It's all that matters at the end of the day. 500 years from now, you're only going to be thinking about that. What do I do with Jesus? It's the only thing that matters. And someone wants... Uh, threw that thing in my face, and he said, you can't uh, leave Jesus on the fence. You have to make a decision. You can't leave him hanging out there. He's Jesus. He's the second person of the Trinity. The Bible says he's the creator of heaven and earth, and so, you know, when he's talking, we should listen, and we've been studying the, the gospel of Luke, and we've been just reading some red words. See, a lot of us have different Bibles. I read out of the New Living Translation, and so in my Bible, when Jesus is speaking, uh, the, the, the words are in red. And of course, he didn't say it exactly like that. He didn't speak English, but we got some real smart people with letters after their name, and they translated it so we could understand what it says. But nevertheless, it's, it's, it's Jesus Christ speaking, and so we should take heed. And so we've been studying through Luke to find out who he is so we could worship him correctly and passionately, and, it's, and you can see it's happening, it's working. Uh, the Word of God is alive, and it's penetrating the people who listen to it, and it's changing people's lives, and I'm happy to see that happening. I'm happy to be back here. I'm happy for the privilege to be able to stand up here and proclaim God's Word to you. I think that, that what I'm doing here is the greatest honor any human being could, could have to be able to do this, to speak the words of the Creator to the creation. That's awesome, and so I appreciate the opportunity to do that. Um, I say all that to say that it's really, uh, I'm from Boston, so I'm just going to say it's, it's wicked important. It's wicked important that you get your eyes on a, a copy of God's Word. Don't just sit here and listen to me. I'm not going to make a lot of jokes up here tonight, so don't think that's what it's going to be about. We're going we're gonna to talk about God's Word. We're going we're gonna to preach God's Word. And so that's what we do here at our church. I don't know what other churches might be doing. I don't know what you did all day or what you're going to do tomorrow. But, but here at our church, uh, we, we talk about Jesus and, and we study his word. And so I think that's probably the best thing for you. And I'm not going to be in any rush to get out of here either because I feel as though that's the most important thing for you is, is God's word. It's, it's way more important uh, than Golden Corral or... or or uh, what's another good one? It, it, itchy bon. Is it Itchy Bon or Icky Bon? Icky Bon? Who thinks it's Icky Bon? Raise your hand. Who thinks it's Itchy Bon? Raise your hand. It's Itchy Bon. It, itchy Bon. Itchy Bon. All right, joke time's over. Luke chapter 12. Get a copy of the Bible. And you'll get a chance to enjoy these fine folks who are going to come here and and, and lead worship here when we get done with God's Word. Um, so Luke chapter 12, and we're going to start in verse 35, and I'm just going to read a section of Scripture first, and we're gonna, we'll pick it apart. All right, I, wanna, I don't want to rush. I want to make sure you get there. Luke chapter 12, we're going to look in verse 35, and I'm going to read all the way through to verse 48. Uh, it's, just, it's, a, it's a section. It's a... It's, 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 Anyway, it's, 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 it's all one uh, story, if you will. It's just one little uh, message from the second person of the Trinity to you. And so I want to ask you this. Look up here for a second. Does God have your attention? Is your, is your, if you're on a phone, is it because you're in the Bible app or are you on Facebook? Okay, no Instagram and no, don't be snapping people up in here, Okay. We're going to read God's word. You ready? All right. So we're in verse 35. Jesus says, be dressed for service. I'm thankful that you guys are. <clears throat> be dressed for service and keep your lamps burning as though you were waiting for your master to return from the wedding feast. Then you'll be ready to open the door and let him in the moment he arrives and knocks. The servants who are ready and waiting for his return will be rewarded. I tell you the truth, he himself will seat them. He, this is the master. He will put on an apron 
and serve them as they sit and eat. That's remarkable. He may come in the middle of the night or just before dawn, but whenever he comes, he will reward the servants who are ready. Understand this, if a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready all the time, for the Son of Man will come when least expected. Peter asks, Lord, is, this, is that illustration just for us or for everyone? And the Lord replies, he answers Peter. A faithful, sensible servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and finds that the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. I tell you the truth, the master will put that servant in charge of all he owns. But what if the servant thinks, my master won't be back for a while, and he begins beating the other servants, partying, and getting drunk. The master will return unannounced, and unexpected, and he will cut the servant in pieces and banish him with the unfaithful. Someone say, <gasps> and a servant who knows what the master wants, but isn't prepared and doesn't carry out those instructions will be severely punished. But someone who does not know and then does something wrong will be punished only lightly. Say they'll still be punished. Okay. When someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. <clears throat> so Jesus is always calling us to new levels. And I think that all of us that have been sitting in this church now for the last eight, nine months will know that to be the case. As we study through the Gospel of Luke, you can constantly, consistently hear Jesus calling you to higher levels, never satisfied with where you are. He's always speaking to his people. You know, the Bible tells us in John 10 that, the, that his sheep, they'll know his voice and they'll follow him. He's always speaking to his people. Did you know that? See, here's the problem. It's not that Jesus isn't always speaking. It's that most of the time his sheep aren't listening. Okay? And that's me too. He, he's never at a loss of words. Jesus is always speaking. He's always leading. He's always talking to the sheep. And they'll hear his voice and they'll follow him, but we're not always listening. He's calling us to higher levels of faith. He's calling us to higher levels of trust, to higher levels of serving and higher levels of giving and higher levels of lowering. In other words, what we talked about a few weeks ago, higher levels of sitting at his feet. And listening as he speaks to us. And, and, and for a lot of people, that's the greatest challenge. The greatest challenge isn't going to do something for Jesus. The greatest challenge is stop what you're doing and sit at his feet and let him pour into you so you're better prepared to go do that which he's tasked you to do. And a lot of people just don't sit there. And we need to. He's calling us to higher levels of trust. Remember last week we talked about a higher level of trust in our salvation, that it was what Jesus did on the cross, on your cross and my cross, he did on your behalf to save you. It was not a work that you did. It's nothing you earned, nothing you deserved, nothing you even wanted, no way you could ever get it, but Jesus loves, and his death on the cross is for you so that you can be saved. So we have to trust his work on the cross on my behalf to save me. Amen. Okay. We, also, we were also reminded that the, the continuing, bless you, the continuing work of the sanctification of the saints, not just saved, but now changed and transformed, is also trusting that Jesus, now indwelling the believer, will continue to do the good work in you until the day he cuts open the clouds and comes back to get you, which is the day of glorification. I get that. We'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. But this ongoing work of God, we have to trust in him to do that work. It's still not something that you do. We live in sanctification. That's where we live right now. There was a day that you didn't know God, that you were his enemy because of your sin nature, just who you were, your active rebellion against him. And one day he invaded that space and he saved you. Do you remember the day? I remember the day. I hope you remember the day. So from that moment to the time of glorification, when he rips open the clouds and comes back to get you, in between those two places is sanctification. 
If you're living right now, if you have bent the knee to Jesus and he is your Lord and Savior, then you're in sanctification right now. You're in school. You're in school and he's always speaking to you. He's always teaching you. He's always changing you from glory to glory. So, so let's talk for a second about this glorification thing because we get saved in a moment in time, then we're sanctified over time, and then one day, right, one day this glorification happens when, when everything that is promised is fulfilled. So the day came, you guys raise your hand, you remembered when you were saved, right? That was an awesome day, right? Say, that was awesome. That was an awesome day. But you didn't get all you were, that's coming to you. So you, you, were, you were given, on that day, you were given a promise and you were given a position. Like, that's who, you're a child of God. You're a son or a daughter of Almighty God that day. That was awesome when that happened. But there's more to come. And you guys know that. This is, not, this is nothing new. You know that, that all that there is is not yet happened. You've been saved, you're being saved, and you're gonna be saved. That one day when he does come and he gathers us up, we're going to go to heaven. Now we fight about that. You know, where's heaven? Is it off in some place? Is it down here on earth? Whatever. You guys fight about it. I really don't give a rip. I'm going. Right? I don't know where it is, but I'm going. But, but, but so he, he returns for his bride, and then all that is promised. You know the streets of gold, right? You ain't walking. Who's walking on streets of gold right here? Nobody. Especially in this joint right? But, but, but one day we will, and it's going to be awesome. And, and that's why Jesus says in John 14, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled, because he, he knows you're in that sanctification period now, where things are a little bit rough. He's continuing to change you. Things are getting a little bit better, but sometimes it feels a little bit worse. You're in that place right now of life, and it's not always awesome. If it was, there'd be no need for heaven. But someday it's coming. But he says, in this, right, in this life right now, in this this portion in this season of your eternal life don't let your hearts be troubled trust in god trust in me he says he says there's enough room in my father's house if not why would i say i'm going to prepare a place and when everything is just right i'm going to come back and i'm going to gather you up and i'm going to take you with me to be with me where i am forever that's glorification it's going to happen listen this is the great hope of the church this, this, in this room, listen, I, I know most of you, some of you are new, and, and I don't know, but I know as I scan this room, I know there's, there's all kinds of different denominations present in this room right now. I, can, I know. And so we, we will, listen, you won't say it probably openly, but we will fight over stuff all the time. We will fight over, over, over all kinds, I'm not going there, but listen, we'll fight about it, right? But, but, but here's one thing that we won't fight about. There's one thing that, that, that brings us all together, whether you're a Baptist or you're a Pentecostal or you're, or you're charismatic or you're totally quiet or, or you're, 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 you're Methodist or, or it doesn't make any difference. All of us know that there's a day coming when, when it's just going to be awesome and, and Jesus is going to come back and he's just going to rescue us all and he's not going to care if you're a Baptist. He's not going to care if you're a Methodist. He's going to say, come on, kids, you're coming with me. He's going to rip the clouds open. He's going to come down, and he's going to rescue us. That's the great hope of the church. And I spoke about that in Easter. We started our one message, right? The big one that was up there. We talked about this. There's one faith and one Lord and one baptism and one glorious hope for the future. And no matter what background you are, if you're a Christian, there's a great hope that one day that the clouds will open and King Jesus is going to come back and make all things good and rescue us from this world. So we're all excited about that, right? But here's the thing. Most of us have a bad understanding of what this Jesus is like. You guys remember the Sunday school picture of Jesus? What did he look like? See, we have a different perspective here because I'm up here and you're down there, but didn't you all see the picture? And his face was kind of over to the right. Yeah. Right? You all know it's all right. He had flowing hair. You might have a hard time with that with me. Like, I'm trying my best, right? You can't pull it off either. Yeah, but at one point we could. Back in like 1987, I could have. But that was a mullet and it wouldn't have worked. And the part in the middle. Did you guys have the part? Did you have a part in the middle? 
And you was, oh, you were straight back? I was part in the middle and feathered back. I was like Sean Cassidy. Come on, don't leave me hanging. She's hitting you, you did it too, didn't you? <laughs> Confession in church, let's go. <clears throat> right, so, 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 but listen, so if I put, I, I thank God I couldn't find that picture, right? But I was thinking about it. I got a yearbook at home and I was gonna take a picture. And, no, I didn't wanna do it because you guys would just laugh me right out of here. It was so bad. But do you ever do, you ever do that? Like you, you go on Facebook and you see like a buddy from, high, you haven't seen him in forever. And then you think, you see the old picture and then the new, and it's like two totally different people. You're like, what, who is that person, right? That, that would have happened if I put my picture up there. You'd be like, who is that Joe Dirt guy? Who is that, right? And that's the same thing with Jesus. See, we, we, we've, been, we've, we've had this picture painted of, of Jesus, right? Uh, the Sunday school picture, and he's, he's, he's looking to the left, right? And, and he's just perfect complexion and long, flowing Fabio hair. And you can just see the top of his perfectly white robe, right? Okay, first of all, that never would have been the case, right? There was like dirt roads and it, and it was like sunny out all the time. And so they didn't have pale skin. Like I don't know where, where that picture even came from, but have you ever seen someone who lives in Israel or Egypt or something? Right, they're as dark as that table, right? And they have dark hair. They're, they're, that, that, that picture's not good. But, but, but listen, the, the Jesus that's coming back has nothing, that picture couldn't be further from the truth. This, this day is gonna come when the, when the heavens rip open and Jesus comes back and it's not gonna be the Jesus in the picture. It talks about in Revelation 19, it says that the, the heavens will open and this Jesus will come riding in on a white horse and his eyes are, fl are like flames of fire and his robe is dipped in blood <laughs> and his title is the word of God. We know who that is, right? And, and, and when you look at this, you're going to see behind him the, 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 the millions, uh, millions of, of heaven's armies will be behind him coming down out of the sky. And, and he will unleash the, the fierce wrath of God. And he'll have a sword coming out of his mouth to strike down the nations who rebel against him. And he'll have a, listen, that Jesus has a tattoo. He's got a tattoo. He's not the little pretty Jesus in your Sunday school class next to the flannel board. He's, he's a tattoo wearing Jesus. And on his thigh, it's, he's got a tattoo. It says, King of King and Lord of Lords. That's the Jesus that's coming back. That's the Jesus that's coming back. Listen, all of us have a favorite Jesus, don't we? You know what I'm talking about, huh? You guys remember this? Check, check this out. Everyone's got a favorite Jesus. The one they like the best. Check this out. Come on, right? Baby. It's a bit odd and off putting to a baby. Well, look, I like the Come Christmas on, Jesus best, and I'm saying Rewind Grace. It. When you say Grace, you can say it to grown up Jesus. Chris. Dear Start tiny up. infant Jesus. Hey, um, you know, sweetie, Jesus did grow up. You don't always have to call him baby. It's a bit odd and off-putting to pray to a baby. Well, look, I like the Christmas Jesus best, and I'm saying grace. When you say grace, you can say it to grown-up Jesus or teenage Jesus or bearded Jesus or whoever you want. You know what I want? I want you to do this grace good so that God will let us win tomorrow. <sighs> Dear tiny Jesus, in your golden fleece diapers with your tiny little fat balled-up fist palm. He was a man. He had a beard. Look, I like the baby version the best. Do you hear me? I don't know what Jesus you like the best, but we know who, who Ricky Bobby likes. He likes the baby Jesus best. You know what Jesus I like the best? Cage fighter Jesus with a tattoo. That's the Jesus I like. That's the Jesus that's going to rip open the heavens someday and come down and rescue us and, and fight off the naughty people. We need that guy. That's who's coming to get me. And, and listen, so that begs the question, when's this going to happen? And, and people ask that. They asked, his disciples asked that. Like, Jesus, when? Okay, awesome, right? Got us all fired up, Lord. I love this. Talking about fired up. Look at verse 49 of, the, of, of what we wrote, of what we read. He says, I've come to set the world on fire. Let me ask you a question. Are you fired up about Jesus? I'm fired up about Jesus. Is anybody fired up about Jesus? I just asked you all a question. It's not hypothetical. 
I'm asking you a question. Are you fired up about Jesus Christ? That's what I'm, that's what I'm talking about, man. I gotta get fired up, man. I'm fired up. Why do you think I stand up here every single week and, and work my blood pressure to the roof? I'm fired up about Jesus Christ, and I want to see you guys get fired up too. He wants you to get fired up. When's this going to happen? Jesus, all right, you're going to cut open the clouds and come down with, a, with your robe dipped in blood, and your eyes are on fire, and, and you got tattoos, and you're big and bad, and you got a sword in your mouth. When's that going to happen? Well, Jesus answered. He's like, well, uh, Dad's got that info. Uh, I, I, I don't even know that. I'm coming, but I, I'm not quite sure when. But I will tell you this. In Jesus' answer here in the text that we read, he, he's calling you, remember, to a higher level. And in this text, he's calling us to a higher level of urgency, a higher level of awareness that this is going to happen. And see, when we talk about getting fired up, people in the church are not fired up about this. And so this complacency and this lethargy in the church, and we blow stuff off like it's no big deal. Oh, it's just Jesus. Listen, I'll repeat this. This is the second person of the Trinity speaking to you. And he means business. He's a tattoo-wearing, eyes on fire, robe dipped in blood God. He means business. And people need to get an understanding of who this Jesus really is. And so we need to get fired up. We need to have a great sense of urgency. When he is speaking, we need to listen. We need to be aware of this, and we need to be ready, he says. We need to be ready. Because I don't know when it's going to happen. Do you know when it's going to happen? I don't know. Nobody knows. People on TV and stuff, they've been talking about it forever. All them freaks, they think they know when he's coming, right? And one by one, they get proven wrong. And Jesus Christ himself says, I don't even know. I'm waiting for dad to say, all right, son, go. And he's like, I'll go. But until then, he's like, I don't really know. But in verse 40, he's very kind to us. He's kind to you because he gives you this awesome warning. Always be ready. Always be ready. Wouldn't that be mean if he gave you a different message? Wouldn't it be mean if he said, well, I don't think it's going to be in the next year or so, so you, you probably could kind of take it easy. Maybe not take his word seriously until 2018, because that's when the fire's really going to get turned up. Like, I'm not sure, but I think. No, he's like, no, I want you to be ready all the time. And so when, when Jesus Christ says that this is going to happen, I'm going to rip open heaven and I'm coming down and always be ready, there's only one question that should pop up into your head. What's ready look like? Because he says be ready, right? Well, okay, I, I, I want to be ready. What, what does ready look like? In other words, what will tattoo Jesus see when he sees me? That should be the question on your lips right now. But Peter... With all of his flaws, and we've seen all of his flaws, you know, when, when, when the little girl says, hey, don't you know Jesus? He like cowardly goes, no, I don't even know him. And then the one time when Jesus says, hey, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to save the world by this way. I'm going I'm to live and I'm going to die and they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna whip me and beat me and kill me and I'm going to rise again. And, and Peter reprimands Jesus. Peter is stupid. And so Peter's stupid here again. Because he doesn't ask the right question. He doesn't ask the only question that matters. And that is, what will Jesus see when he sees me? When he rips open the clouds, what's he going to see? He asks the wrong question. Look at verse 41. Lord, is that illustration just for us or for everyone? In other words, um, who, who, who's off the hook here? Who, who, what, what? What's the least I can do and still get in? Am I starting to infringe upon your life now? Yeah, I am. Because I'm guilty of it too. What's the least I can do? Can, can, I, can I get in on my recliner, Lord? Can, 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 I, can I sit on my fanny down here and still walk the streets of gold up there? You, you, you said that I should store up treasures in heaven. That's cool. What's the minimum down payment on that? I just want to know. Jesus is talking to all Christians here, all of us. If you've bent the knee to Jesus, he's talking to you. 
So when Peter asks this question, which is kind of like, who can get off the hook? He's, God uses him to help you. And Jesus answers back, this is for everybody. The reason why we know that it's for everybody is because it's, look at the context here. Look what's happening in the story. It's master and servant, right? Master and servant. Remember Jesus said you can't serve two masters? Can't got to choose. You got to be one or the other. And so when he talks about a master here and a servant, who's he talking about? Master is who? Him. And who's the servant? Point to that person. You, right? He, this, is, this, is, this might be parabolic, but it's, it's true. He's the master. We're the servant. We serve him. He's the king. And so l- l- just look. L- this is the part that needs, I really need to grab your attention. I need to grab your attention here because there's been a lot of teaching in church that, that you get this fluffy, um, I want to be sensitive but bold, I'm not God at all. And I don't claim to have all the, I am not the oracle of the almighty here, okay? But I, I love it is written stuff, right? And, and, and so when it says stuff, and then I compare that to what I've heard, in ter- and I'm like, wait a minute. I've had this discussion with some of you guys in here when you, you're reading something, and then all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, that's, I've been taught this over and over, and, but wait a minute, that's not what it says. And in this enlightenment world where we are the center, we want to we coerce things and, sh- and change things to make us feel better. And, but this is tattooed wearing, robed, dipped in blood, sword in the mouth, Jesus talking. Right? So what he says, listen, this is a great place for an amen. What he says is the truth and it doesn't matter what i think and it doesn't matter what you think and it doesn't matter what any other pastor or pope or rabbi or your mama thinks if it's in here it is true and so i'm just going to present something to you i need you to pay attention this is important servant and master servant and master he's talking to people who are believers followers of christ is he not? Is anyone in here object to the fact that Jesus is talking to believers, to followers of the master? I think it's very clear in the text, is it not? Okay, so look what it says here. It says in verse 43, it says, if the master returns and finds that the servant has done a good job, there's reward. I'm in on that. I don't even know, like I know this heaven, that's good, but I don't even know the fullness of what that's going to be like. That's going to be awesome, right? But there's reward. Now, does that mean it's just heaven? Look, there's the Bible, here's me now. I don't know. I don't know if anybody knows, but there's reward. So let's just say that good things are going to happen out of that. So so if the, the master returns and he sees that the servant has done a good job, We don't like to talk about that in church. Grace. No, if you've done a good job, there'll be a reward. But if the servant thinks my master won't be back for a while, so he begins to beating other servants, partying, getting drunk. So this is just any, any of all just blatant rebellion against the master. Would you agree? Um, The master will return unannounced and unexpected And he will cut the servant in pieces and banish him with the unfaithful. He goes on to say that if you don't carry out the instructions he has given you, you'll be severely punished. Now, listen, don't don't tell me about the, well, that you were never saved junk, okay? It's clear he's talking to his servants, and he's the master. Okay, those people, you can't tell me they weren't saved or Jesus isn't making a mistake. Going, oh, well, I thought he was saved, but I, did, I, met, I guess I made a mistake. No, he knows everything. He knows who are his. And, and so when he says, listen, you, you, you got saved. That's awesome. Now you're my servant. But if you don't do what I tell you to do, listen, I will banish you to the place of the unfaithful. Listen, I... I those are not, that's not heavenly verbiage, y'all. 
That there's no place in heaven like some department, like you go to a department store and there's automotive and there's children's section and there's, there's home appliances and over, and it's not like that in heaven where everything is great, but over here in this section of heaven are, are the ones who were banished because they were unfaithful. That's not a section of heaven, y'all. You know what I'm saying? The ones who are in heaven aren't, I don't know what you've read about heaven, I just never read anything in all of God's word that would tell me that those that are in heaven are being severely punished. It's enough with this, this Christianity light that made you think that one day you came up and said some prayer and you were saved for all eternity. Listen, you might have gotten saved, but you've got to do something with the Savior that came and rescued you. You gotta do something with his word. You, gotta, you can't ignore the, 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 the tattoo Jesus who's coming down looking for the faithful ones. Don't ignore him. Don't ta- this is not, Christi- not this church. It ain't Christianity light. Ever. Pay attention to what he's saying to you. With those who have ears to hear, uh, let them hear what the Spirit is saying. <clears throat> you know, there's people in... in well, I don't even want to say in Christianity, but in all the world that, that believe like there's kind of like two different Bibles. You know, there's the Old Testament over here, and that's all the rules. And that's mean God over here. Wrath God. Smite God, the mighty smiter, right? He's over here. But, but over here in the New Testament, this is the Sunday school, beautiful Jesus, happy grace God. Two different gods. Two different Bibles, right? I mean, that's what you hear, though. Hear it all the time. Again, I'm not preaching Christianity light. One book, 66 Bible, 66 books, one Bible, one author. That's it. God authored this book. And it's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He's a God who cannot lie. He's a God that does not change. And heaven and earth will will fade away, but the word of God will stand forever. And he didn't say the word of God of the New Testament will stand together forever, but the Old Testament, that's kind of obsolete. We don't care about that anymore. That's the old book that's filled with rules. And in this new book, we get all this grace and everyone's happy and we can do what we want because Jesus knows me. He made me this way. He understands we got a thing. No, you don't. You don't have a thing unless you got his thing. Don't make up your thing. Your thing will fail you. Your thing ain't gonna work. Your thing, you better, you better bring a cold drink if, you got, if you're banking on your thing. There's only one thing. And don't be fooled about this Old Testament, New Testament, uh, old book of rules and new book of grace and love and everything's, everything's awesome and fine and you can get away with stuff because he understands and let's just preach a million messages on God's forgiveness and love and that's great. Uh, but listen to the words that we read. Verse 48, second part of this, of this verse, it says, when someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. Don't blow by this. Don't blow by this and think you got a free ticket to ride and you can do whatever. There's a word in there that's very important. It's required, right? It's required. Sounds like a rule to me. Does it sound like a rule to you when someone, when something's required, is there a lot of option in that? Anyone? Yeah, I don't see any wiggle room in there. When, 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 when you, when, who's a parent in here? Yeah, so when you tell your child that you have to go clean your room, how much, I'm not asking how much wiggle room they think, how much wiggle room do you think there is? Show me. Zero. So don't think that your heavenly father is a lot nicer than you. Because it's more important that we get the, 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 the gospel to the ends of the earth than if, you know, little Billy cleans his room. He, he's got a big concern Okay, big. Is that who I think it is? My dear, how are you, my love? Looking lovely as usual. Much is given, 
Much is required, right? What, what, what have you been given? How about your life? Anyone create themselves? I had nothing to do with that. Praise God. How about everything that you have? Every single thing that you've been given. All your stuff. The Bible says, what, what do you have that you have not received? And if you've received it, why would you act as if you have not received it? See, there's a way to, to conduct yourself in light of what you have that shows honor to the source or to yourself. Make a decision. You know, it also says in Scripture, that all good and perfect gifts come from above. What do you have that you have not received? Who has a car? Who has a place to live? Who has eaten today? Who has food in the fridge for tomorrow? Who has breath in their lungs? What do you have that you have not received? And why would you, if you've received it, why would you act as if you have not? And God is calling us to higher levels. To treat that which he has given you and honor it. Honor him with what you have. All these gifts, are you using them for good? Are you using them to help people? Are you using them to thank God and recognize him as the source of these things that you've been given? Or are you just blatantly, blindly using these things for your own pleasure, never acknowledging the source where they came from? Listen, I'm not, I'm not holier than anybody else, and I'm not telling you that every single time you need to get in your car, by rule that you say, all right, Jesus, thank you for my car, and thank you for the gas mileage that it gets, and thank, like, you don't have to, I'm not saying you have to do that. You could. Wouldn't be bad. That's good advice. But you don't have to. But there's a way that we can conduct ourselves, the way we can respond to those things. I heard a pastor talk about, I've kind of stole his stuff before. You can have a great steak. Anyone like steak? Right. I like steak. I like mine. I like my steak dripping like, like Jesus' robe in blood. Come on, right? I was about to go, real men go like this, and then I saw you raise your hand. I'm like, okay, not doing that. <laughs> real men. <laughs> I like that. I want to see where the jockey was hitting it, you know. <clears throat> so we, you guys like a good steak, right? How do you like your steak? I like mine rare, bloody, and I, I like to marinate it in teriyaki and garlic. And then on, come on, praise Jesus, <laughs> right? right? But what if you don't know Jesus? Then it's just like, it's a good steak. It's good, it's good. But, but if you can enjoy that steak, but while you're enjoying that steak, you start realizing, man, he didn't have to make it yummy. It could have tasted, like if we just needed to eat to live, he could have made steak to taste like this speaker and we would have eaten it because we needed to live. That would have been good enough. But while you're eating, if you start realizing, man, I got a bunch of these little spots on my tongue. And they really go well with the teriyaki. And then you put, put the blue cheese on. Holy, holy. Whoa, right? I can't even. Whew. Yeah. <clears throat> man, and it starts, and you start thinking about those taste buds. He didn't have to do that, did he? But he did. And so there's a way to, there's, there's the non-believer that goes, hey, this is a good steak. Then there's the believer that goes, man, this is a good steak. And praise Jesus, he made it juicy and yummy and dripping with blood. And I got taste buds to enjoy it. Hallelujah. Right? It's better. When you, when, when, listen, how many kids are in here? It's <clears throat> one, two. I can't do that. I can't say what I was going to say. It has to do with girlfriends and wives. You guys following me, adults? There's a difference. 
Momentary joy versus a lifetime of love. Man, it's just different. When you start to take the things that he's given you, like the Bible says that if you've found a wife, you've got a treasure from the Lord. Man. She's not just some squeeze. She's not just some hookup that lasts a few minutes or an evening and it's done. No, she's a treasure. You start thanking the Lord for your wife, man, and then it's even sweeter, man. See, there's a way. And so he says, with, with the person who's been given much, and you all raise your hand, you've been given much, much is required. Don't fool yourself to think that this is, the, this is the Bible of pure grace and nothing's required that there's no rules. It's not the case. And, and Jesus is calling us even higher than that. If you read the Bible, you, you might remember that, that uh, well, forget the Bible for a second. I know you can't believe I just said that. Strike that from the record. But, but, but. If you're not even a believer, you know that if you're married and you have an affair, that's what? Adultery, right? It's adultery. If there's some inappropriate physical contact, that's adultery. We all know it, even if we're not Christians. We know. But Jesus is always calling us to higher levels. And he says, if you have um, physical thoughts about that person, like if you're thinking about doing that, you don't even have to do it and you've already done it. He's always calling us to a higher level. And so he says here, with, with, when someone's been given much, you've been gifted, it's yours now. I give you this steak. I give you this wife. I give you these children. I give you this house. I give you this career. I give you every, everything that you have. I'll give you that. It's yours now. Do what you will with that. He says, much is required of you. But if you've been entrusted with something, even more is required. What does that mean, Jesus? I got a definition for entrust that's right up there on the screen. You can, if you're a note taker, and I hope that you are, I think it sends a message to the Lord that you mean business. You're not coming in here to go through the motions. To be entrusted with something is to be assigned the responsibility of doing something and also to put something into someone's care or protection. So it's, it's not just taking something and, and saying, okay, this is, this, is, um, this is my microphone. Let's just, it's not, but it's Jesus' microphone. But if, if this is my microphone and I give you this, now it's yours. You can do what you want with it. You can honor me with that or you can dishonor me. You can do what you want. But there's a difference between that and, hey, this is my microphone I'm not giving it to you, but I'm asking you to hold on to it for me. Do you see the difference? It's still mine, but I'm asking you to hold on to it. Also, let's talk about this. Um, to assign, a, oh, I can take that, yeah. <laughs> Unless you want to start preaching. It's not hooked up. Okay, so, 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 <clears throat> so also not just something, but, but assigned a responsibility. So this, so there's a couple of things. Let's talk about some of the things that have been entrusted to you if you're a believer, if you're a follower of Christ. One, you've been entrusted with his spirit, right? You, it, listen, he may have given you the spirit, but it's not yours. It's his. He doesn't lose his identity when he indwells your chest cavity. He is still God. He, he's, he's given himself to you, but you don't now own him. He hopefully owns you. But, but, but he, it's still his spirit. It's still the Holy Spirit of Christ indwelling in you. So he's, he's entrusted you with his spirit. That's why we talk about the, that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that's why I kind of keep myself like an Adonis. <laughs> but we're, yeah. Woo! So, but we, we, we're supposed to take care of this thing because this is where Jesus is hanging out. And, and to a lesser degree, uh, our church buildings, right? We don't want to, they don't need to be a dump, right? This is, what, this is, this is God's house, where God's spirit is dwelling in his, in his believers, with, in God's people, right? So we wouldn't make it a dump because his spirit is, is roaming around in here, ministering in and through his people. So we don't create some dump, we make it kind of nice, you know? Doesn't have to be Caesar's palace, but it could be nice, Right? Would you have a dump that you live in? No, you make it nice because the person who owns it is important, you. Well, the person who owns you is Jesus 
and you've been entrusted with his spirit, what are you going to do with that thing? That's, that's the second part. That's putting something into someone's care or protection. His spirit is now in you. It's not yours. It's his, but it's in you. What are you going to do with that? How are you going to treat it? And then the other definition assigned a responsibility of doing something. Well, when you bent the knee to Jesus, he, his spirit came to dwell in you, but he also put you on his mission. His mission, 2 Corinthians 5.18. God has given us the task of reconciling people to him. Paul would say it this way, that we have been given treasures in, in, in clay jars. Fragile clay jars. Just us. And, and he has put his spirit and, into us, and he's given us this responsibility, this mission to go tell people about him. Listen, you are his plan you are when we were doing our offering remember we talked about if it was your child that was in in par like they were dying and you needed to rescue them what would you do what would you do come on now you everything right i'd go after listen when they were telling that story last night i'll cry i wanted to leave that concert and go hug my kids so bad we got home at two in the morning and we still went to Mimi's house because Meredith's like, I need my babies. Because that guy told a story about his child that died at five years old. What would you do, right? Anything. Go to your last breath to save that person. And God the Father is looking down at all these people on earth and he loves them just as much as I love Wubby. That's what I call Jameson. Just as much as I love Roni, that's what I call Jackson. Just as much as you love Jojo. Just as much as you love Courtney. And you do anything to rescue her. And so God has commissioned you to go rescue people. You are his only plan. If you don't go, if you don't take this word seriously and go, who's going to rescue them? With a gift, much is required. With a trust, even more is required. But there's too many pew sitters. There's too many people in the bleachers. And there's not enough people on the field. There's not enough people in the game. And if the clouds were tore open today, and cage fighter Jesus came down with a sword in his mouth, we'd see you building, I'm talking about right now, or tomorrow, if he ripped the clouds open, tomorrow, would he find you building his kingdom or building yours? It's a huge important question because we don't know when he's coming. And Jesus Christ said, be ready, and that's what be ready looks like. Pursuing his mission, not pursuing yours. That's why just before this, he's like, stop storing up treasures here on earth that will never last. You can't take them with you. Start storing up treasures in heaven where moths can't get to it and rust can't rot it away and, fate and, and, and thieves can't steal it. What would he find if he opened the clouds Tuesday at three o'clock? That might be prophetic for someone in here. I don't know what you're doing. But, but, but what would he find? What would Jesus, because you don't know when it's going to happen, do you? Nancy, do you know when it's going to happen? I don't know when it's going to happen. Right, but when he does, right, wouldn't it be awesome? Like for me, just for me, like this, I, no one else in here, well, no, I'm sorry. We got another preacher right there. But what could be better than if Jesus ripped open the clouds while I was up here proclaiming his word to you? That would be the best thing ever, right? Or, or what would be better than if you're in the band and you're singing praises to Jesus, right? And we're in the middle of this one verse that's just going, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And then the next very breath, you're saying the same thing in glory. That would be awesome if that happened. I want Jesus to find me doing that. And I want Jesus to find you doing that. And I don't know when he's gonna come, but he's coming and he said, always be ready to be a faithful servant. Are you doing a good job? Are you carrying out his instructions? 
How are you doing with what he's entrusted to you? Only you know, I don't. Listen, are you doing all that is required of you? I don't think that Jesus softens up in the New Testament at all. It might not just be lists of thou shalt and thou shalt nots. He had a way of doing it poetically, beautifully, but he still means business. He's still the same God that burned in the bush. He's still the same God that rumbled at the top of Mount Sinai. He's still the same God that opened the Red Sea. He's the same God that wrote the Ten Commandments who's telling you right now, if I've entrusted you with my spirit and I've entrusted you with my mission, I mean business about it. And it's required that you do with it as I tell you. You can't just say, well, you know, I think I'll do this kingdom stuff on Thursdays and maybe pepper it in on Sunday morning, but the rest of the time is mine. That's Christianity light. It's not going to get preached here. Amen. Ever. <clears throat> there are certain things that are required. Now, Jesus never tells you to do something that is so outrageous that he wouldn't do it. He's an awesome leader. Amen. That was weak. Okay, I'm talking about Jesus now. Jesus was an awesome leader. Amen. Yeah. Are, do you mean that or are you just saying it because I told you to? Okay, I'm going to just check in. <clears throat> so we see that he leads by example. And we see this in John chapter 4. You can turn there. I'm not going to read the story of Jesus and the lady at the well. It's a long story, but, but basically it's, it, and, and many of you know the story, many of you may not, you may never, this might be your first night in church ever, and that's cool, and if, if you've made that decision, I, I'm rejoicing, I think that's awesome, and that you would choose this place, that's incredible, thank you. But if you've never read the story, let me just kind of give you the cliff notes. So, so he goes, and he meets this lady who has very low morals, and she's been shacking up with one guy after another and she's with another one now and Jesus kind of calls her out on that in a nice way but but he does very clear um but he's it's the story where they taught what Jesus talks about um uh, God wants people to worship him in spirit and in truth and that's kind of the jump off point for this whole series in Luke is we want to learn the truth so we can get fired up like Jesus said about worshiping him Right? And so, so that's the story. There's this, there's this woman, she comes to the well, and she's, she's looking to, to get some water, and Jesus is there, and he asks her for water, and, she's, and so they have this conversation, and that's when he calls her out on her morality, and then he starts like teaching her some stuff, and she's like totally floored, and she goes back to the village, and she's like, hey, meet this guy, and the people come back, and it's amazing. But here's the cool thing about, about this story different things we could teach. We could teach on this thing for weeks and weeks and weeks. But tonight I want to just say this. Um, Jesus is Jewish and Jews had nothing to do with Samaritans. This woman was, 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 a, was a Samaritan. And, and they, had, they, they didn't like the Samaritans. And the Samaritans didn't like Jewish people. Like they were enemies. They didn't get along, right? And so if you would, if I was a good pastor, I'd have a picture for you, but I'm not. So just imagine that Israel is like this column right here. And you, can, you guys, you see Israel right there, right? You guys have seen the map. You know what Israel kind of looks like, right? So um, down here would be um, Judea like, and Jerusalem would be kind of over here. And then there's a section, a cross section here, Samaria. And then above it is the little Sea of Galilee where Jesus did most of his ministering. And most of the miracles and all that kind of stuff is all happening over there. So right in the middle of those things is Samaria. And so um, Jesus goes to Samaria and, and he talks to this lady. And the lady starts talking to him about water. And he's like, well, I have different kind of water. And, and she's like, what do you mean? You, don't, you can't get water and you don't have a bucket. And, and he's like, oh, yes, I do. <laughs> you know, I got a bucket, all right. Uh, it's you. You're the bucket. And, and you want to fill the bucket with a bunch of water that's just going to please temporarily. And I want to fill you, bucket, with a bunch of eternal water that's going to please you forever. 
And, and so they go through that, but she's thinking shallow. And then the disciples come along while he's talking to her. And they're like, what is this guy? Why is he talking to this girl? And, and, and hey, you should go get something to eat. So she's talking about uh, drink. And they're talking about getting something to eat. And, and, and verse 32 of, of John chapter 4, um, Jesus is like, um, I, uh, I have a, I, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I don't need to eat. I'm good. Rabbi, eat something. No, I have a, food, a kind of food you know nothing about. And they're like, huh. Did someone bring him something to eat? They're just dumb. <clears throat> and, and, and so, did someone bring him food while we were gone? And, and Jesus is like, no, knuckleheads. They're, they're, he didn't say that. That's just me. But he says, no, my nourishment, my food, uh, comes from doing the will of God who sent me. And from finishing his work. And, and so in verse uh, right, 33, when they talked about the food, that they're still super, super shallow. And I talked about Jesus leading by example. This is what I mean. Last week, we taught right from Luke where Jesus is teaching, don't worry about everyday life. Don't worry about what you eat and drink. Seek first the kingdom of God. Advance my mission in you and through you. That's what you need to do. Don't think about what you eat and what you drink. And so you see the people, what are they doing? They're thinking about eating and drinking. And that's us. We're thinking about seeking pleasures to ourselves to satisfy ourselves temporarily. And Jesus is like, no, I got a different food inside of me that drives my life. I want to do what's required of me, Jesus said. I want to do the will of God who sent me, my Father, and from finishing his work. Most people are seeking personal satisfaction all the time with their days and their moments. And Jesus is always seeking Father satisfaction. That's what he's doing. And Christ followers follow Christ. And Jesus says, this is what I live for. And this is what I do. And I will do the work that's been entrusted to me, and I will not leave it incomplete. I will do that which the Father requires. That's Jesus Christ the Lord. Here's the amazing thing. Remember the map, right? <laughs> it says in verse 4, Jesus had to go to Samaria. Do you know that he didn't have to go? <clears throat> here's Jerusalem. Follow me now. Here's Jerusalem right here. Do you see it? And here's Galilee. And here's Samaria. And right between the two is this mountain range. But on either side, it's flat land. Especially over here by the Jordan River. Not only is it flat, but it's plush and beautiful. And it would have been a nice walk in the park. But Jesus didn't go that way. He went to Sychar. Do you know where Sychar is? Dead center on the highest mountain in between the two places. Listen, if you go to England right now, you, got, you have to go over the ocean, Do you, right? Okay. He didn't have to go to Sychar. He could have taken a left or a right and gone any way he wanted to. He's God! And it would have been easier for him to go left or right to the plush flatlands for a nice stroll, but instead he hiked up the most awful mountains, dry desert heat on purpose. I had to go because my father said, it's time to reap a harvest. I had to go. I have to go. Jesus knew that geographically he didn't have to go. And culturally, he certainly didn't need to go. But because his father gave him a mission, he knew he had to go. There was no choice. He had to go. This is the harvest story. You see, in verse 35, this is everybody's statement in verse 35. I don't like it in the New Living Translation. It's kind of weak. Most translations, it's this. This is the statement of the people. Jesus is like, let's go, let's go build my church, right? Matthew 16, 18. I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Let's, go, let's get this, listen, let's get this sucker going. 
I want people fired up for me. I want my church packed. I want 7 billion people worshiping me with hands held high. Don't you think that's what he wants, right? Is that what you want? No, 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 no. Come on. You ain't getting off the hook that easy. Is that what you want? I want that. And that's what Jesus wants, right? So he says, I got to do this thing. But the people are like, well, kind of busy. And Jesus goes, hey, you guys, have a, you guys have a saying, don't you? I love his sarcasm. Don't you guys have a saying? Uh, it's four months to the harvest, right? You know, just, especially down here in Florida, I find, even though I love you, that there's a, there's a, a laziness. You know what I mean? It's just, it's, hey man, it's just, it's flip-flop weather, man. It's just, take it easy, man. It's five o'clock somewhere. Really? <clears throat> and, and so this, this statement from Jesus is just like, us, can't this wait, Lord? I'm kind of busy today. I've got stuff I've got to do today. <laughs> and he's like, um, wake up! Wake up, sleepyhead. Look around you. The harvest is ripe. And it's now. And it's right in front of you. And the people, his disciples, they didn't even see it. Right? When Jesus talked to this lady, she, told every, she went back in town to tell everyone about him. And here come all the Samaritans that the Jews hated. And here they come. It says everyone in town came. So here's this crowd coming after Jesus, uh, to come see Jesus, right? And the, the disciples didn't even recognize it. That was the harvest. Those people that they hated, that was the harvest. Those are the ones that God was going after. That's why Jesus had to go to Sychar, because there was a harvest to be had. They were the people that were coming right to them and they didn't even see it. How about the people in your, in your neighborhood? How about the people at your job? How about the people in your family? How about the people at the gym? Wherever you go, there's a harvest to be had. But we're waiting. Wake up and look around. Jesus wasn't worried about food and water, right? That's a snack. He was ready for a harvest, right? A harvest. What do you think of when you think of a harvest? You think abundance. You think a full table. You think about barns filled with food, not just some plate with a dinner for the moment. A harvest. Can you see it? Can you see the harvest? Can you see it? Can you see the people? Can you see the people that God loves? Can you see the people that God created in his image to be like him? Can you see them chasing their tails without hope? Can you see Jesus crying over them because they're like a sheep without a shepherd? Can you see yourself as a child of God who's been given the task to go reconcile those people back to God? To seek and save that which is lost. That's what Jesus said was his mission. And Christ followers follow Christ. So you have to say, that's my mission too. That's my mission. Can you say it? That's my mission. Come on. That's my mission. Stand up. Come on, stand up. Let's hear it. That's my mission. Can someone other than Mike yell? That's my mission. That's the mission of Jesus Christ, to seek and save that which is lost. If you're a Christ follower, that's your mission. That's my mission, say. Somebody say, that's my mission. That's my mission. That's my mission. God's entrusted you with the mission to go save the world. It's your mission. How will they know unless they are told? 
And how will they be told unless they are sent? And Jesus Christ sent you. He said, go preach to the nations. Make disciples of all people. And baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teach them all that I have taught you. Listen, that is my mission. That is my mission. That's the mission that you've been entrusted with. Will you respond to what's been required of you? Or will you stay on the bench? Will you sit in the bleachers? Or will you jump in the game? Listen, this is not just a hoorah. Don't say good job, preacher. You have been commissioned and entrusted with a mission to go seek and save that which is lost. Jesus is calling you to something higher. Higher trust, higher faith, higher levels of commitment to his mission. Is it your mission? It is my mission. Say it one more time before we worship. It is my mission. Let's worship our King. everybody is really serious about it yet. I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced yet. On the count of three, I want to hear it like you mean it, like from the bottom of your toes, that you mean it, that what you say you mean. Listen, he's not looking for someone to make a commitment that they won't keep. God frowns upon that. He wants you to count the cost. It's not going to be easy. You got to be bold. You got to be, you got to be on your knees. You got to be praying. You got to be serving you got to boldly tell people about him. And they don't want to hear it. They might not want to hear it, but you got to boldly preach it anyway. God says that if you've been entrusted with something, much is required. And that's what Jesus did. He came down to save us. He came to save you. If you've been saved, then you've been entrusted with the mission of reconciliation. Jesus said, that is my mission. And his people said, his people said, one more time, amen.